the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and one God. Amen. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. I'm um, very happy to be back with you guys uh, studying the book of James. Hopefully, you guys have your Bibles with you. And um, if you wanted to take notes or kind of, you know, your highlighters or things like that that you want to keep along with you um, during the study, I would highly recommend to have something with you, um, at least to write down maybe sayings of the church fathers or um, connecting different passages if you find that you see a connection. Uh, my goal today is to finish the rest of chapter one. Uh, this would be the third installment of chapter one. So hopefully we can kind of um, finish up to verse 27 today. And the next week we start chapter two. Um, and last time we were finishing around verse uh, 16 and 17. So that was around um, when we were talking about the inner temptations. And we're going to see St. James transition into point number four here, where we talk about our role as children of God. So now that we've um, talked about how to resist temptation, the outward temptation, the inward temptation, then what do we do with that? What do we do with that um, as we move forward as our role ch as children of God? And so this is kind of where we left off from last time. Um, we read the verses 16 to 17 where we read, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift in every perfect gift is from above and comes from uh, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so we were contemplating on these verses, and especially in the context of everything that we were talking about. And we see how St. James was urging his, his brethren, right? His very, this, this term of endearment, where he says, my beloved, in, my beloved brethren. Um, he urges them tenderly uh, not to be deceived into thinking God does not love them. So even if we're facing various trials, even if we're facing uh, different ch uh, challenges in life, um, we can't fall into the temptation of thinking that God doesn't love you. And, um, you know, we have to take a big step back and think, you know, out of all the innumerable gifts that God has given us, um, you know, the new birth in which we have received through baptism, uh, we have become his children. And that's the greatest gift of all. And we can call him father. And he, you know, when we, if we assign um, evil to God, it, it's wrong, right? Why? Because he's the father of lights. Asking goodness away from God, it, it's wrong. If we look for satisfaction or peace away from God, it's, it's wrong. Why? Because he is the father. Um, he doesn't accept that his children seek any father besides him. And so... Every good gift is for our own good and every perfect gift presented as a free gift from above and that we see this continuous overflow from heaven toward us from father to children. And so God does not allow testing uh, and persecution so that we fall or that we fail. No, it's so that we succeed and we become holy and we become perfect, right? He only gives us good things. And so all the, the all good and giving perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And so we continue to verse 18. Of his own, he will, uh, of his own will, he brought us forth by, his, by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. And so we see here, <clears throat> as proof of everything that we just talked about, St. James reminds us of the call that, that God has freely and deliberately intended for each one of us in Christ. Through no compulsion, um, God brought us forth by the word of truth, right? Giving birth to us as his children, that we may be a sort of first fruits of his creatures. He didn't have to save us, but he did. Um, in the end, he will transfigure the cosmos, right? But for now, he has transfigured us, right? As the first fruits and pledge of what he will do for us and all his creatures, right? His entire creation. So if we kind of start to summarize chapter one, as we, as we kind of end and we talk about these last verses, we see in chapter one how St. James transferred us from mentioning, you know, the outer temptations as a source of joy, right? To bless those who are struggling and patiently struggling. And then he encourages us 
to fight against the, the inner temptations, which is to avoid sin, right? And then he progresses us to mention God's care, right? Offering all possibility to declare his love for us and to become his children. And so we see as a natural response, like what is our, what is our job now? What is our role? Um, what do, where do we stand as his children? What, what are we supposed to do with all this? And then we see how St. James addresses this practically in the, in the remaining verses. And so, since, um, therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, St. Arsani is, is famous for saying, often I have talked and regretted, but I have never regretted being silent. It's such a powerful statement. Since God has begotten us uh, by the word of truth uh, through baptism, the first duty, our first responsibility, which we have to perform is our practical duty, right? Our obligation as children of God uh, is that when, when we face fi- uh, times of persecution, when we face um, stress, challenges, I, I think, you know, this verse is very applicable to what we're, what we're, what's uh, happening in our lives today. The stress and the challenges of life can tempt one to be overly defensive to everyone. You know, to angrily um, shout back before even hearing what the other person has said, right? And to uh, harbor a hostility when it's all over. And so instead, what St. James is saying is that every man must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath right very practically what does this mean in our in our homes today and this is a big lesson for me believe me very practically we have to start with just letting the other person finish what they're saying right we're so quick to cut them off and to give our point and to defend ourselves and to say that they're wrong and we're right you know no saint james is saying let the other person finish First, weigh a response. Think about it carefully before you respond. And don't instantly turn to wrath. Don't instantly turn to wrath. And the word wrath here in the Greek, it refers not so much as a sudden outburst, but more of a a smoldering resentment, right? And we have to resist this in every way possible. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God right? It's a strong reminder. Christians don't need to angrily defend themselves. It's a bold statement. A Christian does not need to angrily defend themselves, okay? So during these times of stress and challenges in our own homes, I, 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 maybe it's a good practice if we print this verse out and we have it uh, very visible. So it's, it's a constant reminder that we have to be swift to hear and slow to speak weigh your responses think about what you want to say and be slow to wrath so that we don't give in to a resentment right Uh, because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness of the implanted uh, word which is able to save your souls and so again, this is our, our obligation now as children of God. This is our task. This is what we do, right? Um, the task of every Christian is to put off all moral filthiness and um, the abundance of wickedness. We, we have to put these things aside. The Christian has to reject whatever evil remains of their old life, right? It needs to be a complete once and for all commitment to holiness, right? Not a half-hearted rejection of evil, not this lukewarmness, right? Let your yes be yes, right? You don't look back. You always look forward when we're talking about the Christian lifestyle. And so, you know, this will be possible in meekness, right? And when we welcome the implanted word. So the, the word we receive it in very different ways, right? The word is the, is the teaching. It's the teaching that's given to us by our servants, our parents, 
um, our spouses, our children, they can give me a big word of understanding, right? Um, they, can, uh, they can teach me a lot. It can come from the priests, it can come from different sermons, it can come from the church. So this implanted word is what is the teaching that um, has already been living in our hearts and it needs to be ignited. Uh, and we welcome this teaching. Uh, we welcome the teaching in our, in our inner hearts and we humbly accept correction. And we eagerly look for these opportunities for such teachings. That's why the church, you know, it's one of my favorite parts in a baptism. Uh, it's my favorite thing. That's why I don't, I don't even ask Abuna David if he wants to read this part, but the commandment given to the godparents and the parents, I always take it. I always, I always really enjoy this part because it's a constant reminder for me. But what the church is saying in the baptism, when we read the commandments to the parents and the godparents, we say, plant in them the good habits, plant in them obedience, plant in them love and purity and mercy, giving alms, justice and righteousness and patience and goodness, right? This is what the church commands each one of us plant in the kids that we serve and the, and the kids that we raise and in our own hearts. Um, see, the thing is, when we listen to all these sermons and we're jumping on all these Zoom calls and we're, we're participating in all these kind of things, we're not supposed to receive this word of instruction as just Christian entertainment, right? Um, but we receive this, this word and we want it to be implanted word, right? That's able to save our souls. It's a big difference. It's very different to hear a sermon and say, you know what? I agree with that priest. I love what he says all the time. You know, he just has a really good way to say it. And we agree, but we don't do anything about it. Right? No, we, we receive it so that it enters our hearts and it's implanted in our hearts so that it can save our souls. Right? Um, no wonder why we should welcome it and look for opportunities for it to receive it because it will save our souls, right? We notice St. James, it's subtle and I, and I hope you, you caught it. We notice when St. James is talking to the believers and to the baptized people, but he says, which is able to save your souls. In other words, he didn't say that your souls are saved. Salvation is a continuous process where the believer lives in it all the days of his life. It's not a one-time event. Salvation is not a one-time event for the believer. And so St. James advises us to submit when, with, with a spirit of meekness, a spirit of humility, uh, not with haughtiness, not with pride, to the word of God that we have to struggle all the days of our life uh, so that we don't lose our way. And then he goes on to say, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, in verse 22. The submission has to be practical, not theoretical, right? It's not a theoretical hearing of the word of God. But he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Not those who hear the law are justified before God, but those who obey the law are justified before God. So the, the goal in our lives is to become doers of the word, and not hearers only. To be a hearer only was a temptation of the Jews. In fact, some Jews believe that the Torah is such a divine gift that it was enough to be a hearer of the law to be justified. But the law was only given so that it might be carried out in one's daily life. So if one merely thinks um, that hearing is enough, they're deluding themselves, right? They're deceiving themselves. And unfortunately, they're going to receive a very harsh reality in the day of judgment. And he goes on to say, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets uh, what kind of man he was. And so <coughs> St. James compares himself, uh, compares, uh, him, he compares him to a man looking himself in a mirror. And it's important for God's children to look to the word of God, right? Which is a mirror that reveals their, their weaknesses and shortcomings. It also reminds them of, of their new spiritual creation, which is the heavenly birth. So St. James paints a picture 
of a man who checks himself out in the mirror and then he rushes off doing nothing about what he had just seen. You know, the idea is the reason why someone looks in the mirror in the first place is for, is for the sole purpose of washing off whatever dirt they see there, right? In the same way, a man only hears the word in order to improve his life and to repent of whatever the teachings instructs him to repent of, right? And so, but he who uh, looks in, into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in whatever he does. So instead of imitating a man who looks at his face and then he forgets it, right? The Christian must look intently into the perfect law, the teachings of the church that bring freedom. And so the word peer or the, the idea of looking in Greek, it refers to stooping down, right? You stoop down to have a closer look. So the believer is to have a long, closer look, a hard look at the perfect law, meditating on the teachings of Christ and to remain alongside it. And so the thought of St. James here is that the Christian <clears throat> is to constantly be in the company of the teachings. You know, in Psalm 1, to meditate day and night of the law, right? To, to constantly be in the, the company of the teachings, uh, to never leave it, but always keeping them in mind. Uh, this man will not, you know, simply be a hearer, but he will be a doer, a doer of good work, and therefore he will be blessed in what he's doing. His days will be full of good works and full of the blessings of God. Okay, it's an amazing, an amazing promise. And this, these kind of promises are, are throughout scripture. Um, and so when you delve into the scripture and you come across these verses that complement each other, it really, it really puts it all together for you. And then in verse 20, uh, 26, we read, if anyone among you, uh, among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. It's very, it's a, it's a very clear reprimand, right? Um, St. John Saba said, whoever is cautious with his tongue, his treasure will never be taken away from him. The mouth of a silent translate the mysteries of God, and whoever swiftly talks distance himself from his, crea from, from his creator. You know, it, it's easy to think of oneself uh, to be religious and pious simply because we, we are hearers of the law and we say prayers, right? If a man reads the scripture, and fulfills his prayer rule, but doesn't control his tongue. St. James is saying that this man deceives his own heart and that he is not truly religious as he thinks he is. And his religion and acts of holiness are useless and will gain no reward from God. So St. James is emphasizing the role and the, the necessity to uh, control our tongues. I love the way that St. James points out things that we may overlook, you know, as long as we're praying and as long as we're, we could be um, serving the homeless every single weekend and we could be doing these acts of charity, but we don't control our tongue. It's, his religion is useless. That it's so powerful. It's so deep. True religion stems from the inside, St. James is saying. It comes from the heart. And what's the connection here? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, we read our Lord saying, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we don't have the word of God implanted in our hearts, uh, then unfortunately what comes out of our mouth, it, it can really... Uh, it can really be very dangerous. So it's a big warning for each one of us. And St. James concludes chapter one by saying, pure and defiled 
religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It's a very um, beautiful summary of what religion is, right? And what is accepted in front of God. Pure, what is pure and offer, what is a pure offering that we can offer God, right? The religion that is, that is pure and undefiled before God is this, is to visit the orphans and the widows in their tribulation and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does this mean? This is the piety that brings reward from God. This is what we can truly offer God. When we hear the word, right? But we, but, and we become fulfilled in works. Um, hearing must result in doing. Hearing must result in doing. And so the first doing is St. James mentions to visit the orphans and the widows. Why, why then? Why, why does he say that so, so specifically? The poorest in the society and those with no resources to, to help themselves, right? The ones who are in true tribulation and distress. The believer, the Christian, should be concerned to help the poor and to alleviate their sufferings whenever possible. God, the Father, is a father to all his children, even to, to these uh, humble and poor. Second, St. James mentions to keep oneself unstained from the world. And, and the world here means the network or the systems of relationships that oppose God. It, it's to keep oneself unstained from worldliness, Right? It's not a physical withdrawal from society, but an inner detachment from it. Don't be attached to this world. Though this world always exerts a pull on the believer, and it drags the believer away from the closeness to God. So true religion clings to God, and it clings to God in every way, and it shows mercy to the poor, and it seeks only the kingdom of God. The believer, if the believer will be a doer of the word like this, God will reward. This is a very clear promise. If the believer applies the word like this, it's a very clear reward. St. James did not say, you know, notice, he didn't say that pure religion is faith. But he revealed the practical aspect, not ignoring or not demeaning faith, but emphasizing the good deeds, the good work, right? The good work that's associated with, with faith. In other words, hearing must result in doing. And we'll end there for today, and glory be to God. And next time, we're going to uh, continue our talk into chapter 2.